asteroid belt, huge chunks of rock and metal orbiting the sun between Jupiter and Mars. It's no place to try and fly a spaceship, especially the one that was steering through it at the moment. A sleek, black, Zephyr-class Hellstrom Thunder, to be precise. What is this? A meteor shower? Asked the sole passenger of the ship, a hooded figure, forcefully as he was jolted slightly to the side by a particularly sharp manoeuvre. We've hit the asteroid belt, literally, responded the ship's pilot. The ship's pilot, a native of Ven Kruknar, was equally at home swimming in the depths of the Zen Ocean or flying superfast starships in deep space, though at the moment he would have much preferred to be doing the former instead of the latter. Trying to keep his calm, he shouted out to his passenger again, The ship can withstand the smaller impacts if I can just... Fly us through the worst of it. The hooded passenger was known only as the Crollius. Few have ever seen his face and lived. The stench of the toxic gas he breathes out was enough to keep all except the most foolish at bay. The cargo must be protected, he rasped. The cargo in question was a dozen alien life forms stored in quasi-digital suspension, each held within their own data pad. This was the Crollius' greatest achievement. And at this moment, it was probably the most precious cargo in the solar system. Each life form had been painstakingly collected from specific locations across the galaxy, lured into the grasp of the Crollius for his own evil purposes. Of course, by the luck of the universe, it was this instant that the ship hit into an asteroid with a massive thud across one of its primary thrusters. The shock caused the pilot to do what all pilots struck by a very sudden disaster do. State the obvious. We've hit an asteroid! I've lost control! He screamed. With a steely cam, the Crollius pointed at a nearby planet of green and blue through the front view screen. That planet. Aim for that planet. Taking deep breaths, the pilot aimed for it as best as he could as they rapidly spiralled out of control. We're going to crash! shouted the pilot as they came into its atmosphere. Meanwhile, at 13 Bannerman Road. Mr Smith, I need you said Sarah Jane. With a fanfare, Mr. Smith appeared from within the wall. Good afternoon, Sarah Jane. I came as quickly as I could. What's wrong? Well, Sarah Jane, I have detected a very peculiar transmission on the sub-ether wavelength. My analysis shows it to be an ion-drive spaceship in trouble and headed for Earth, chimed Mr. Smith. Sarah Jane knew she would have to investigate this. Where on Earth? On the ever-nearing ship, the pilot was determined. I can save the ship! I know I can! The Crullius snarled as he worked swiftly at the controls for his datapod storage interface and replied, The datapods must be protected. I am initiating the emergency upload procedure. The inhabitants will have a primitive but suitable enough digital network for them to be uploaded to. But, but, but what about us? said the pilot, gripping tightly to the steering rods. I will join the datapods. My interface has a built-in digital bioconverter and transmitter, replied the Crollius, as he began to shimmer in the blue light. But, but what about me? squealed the worried pilot. You said you could save the ship, so save it! was the barked response of the Crollius as he was converted into data and transferred into the ongoing upload. The ship continues downwards. There's little more the pilot can do than aim for a relatively uninhabited area and hang on as it goes down. Aiming for one of the large oceans that dominate the planet was sadly too far out, so he aimed for woodland. The descent is missed by unit. They were all busy fighting a robotic dinosaur from the future, and Torchwood. They were all busy doing things that couldn't possibly be repeated in words. Even the Morpsal Society misses it. Only one human being, a young boy called Ram, out in the woodlands on a camping trip with his father, notices the glimmer black speck above. He mentions it to his father, but his father dismisses the thought, and sure enough, it is long gone from the boy's sight within a few more seconds as it rattles onwards. Aside from the young boy, the only other individual to take notice of this is, of course, Mr. Smith. To every other radar or telemetric detector, it is all but invisible. But invisible or not, it can't fight gravity. 
it smashes into the ground. Inside, the shaken pilot already starts to pull himself from the remains of the control room. He knows if he isn't quick, he will likely be caught in the explosion of the engine. Soon enough, Sarah Jane and her son Luke arrive at the Rockshaw Reservoir from Mr Smith's guidance. They get out of the car, baffled slightly by the lack of obvious signs of a ship, but there is a noticeable crater. Sarah Jane opens her watch and takes a reading. There is a crashed spaceship here, but it's invisible. You can still see the marks in the ground where it hit, though, Luke noted. Why use some kind of cloaking device if you know the evidence of a crash will still be obvious? He's halted by a sudden explosion of blue that throws both of them backwards off their feet. Luckily, though, both are shaken. Neither are injured by this. Mom! shouted Luke, his first instinct, even though he's lying flat on the ground. He lifts his head, worry on his face. It's all right. I'm fine, Luke, she reassured him. What now? That's... Sarah Jane begins to piece together as she stands. But Luke has already thought it all through. Dusting himself off as he too stands, he rattles out. You said it was an ion drive spaceship. The ion drive must have exploded, completely vaporised the ship. Even the crater's less noticeable now, nothing left at all. But it can't have gone critical that quickly. Even with a crash like that, it should have lasted longer. Yes, which means someone must have destroyed it deliberately. Someone who probably hasn't gone far from here, she added to her son's explanation, and they both begin to search. Back at Sarah Jane's house, Clyde and Rani had their own troubles to deal with. What's up, Mr Smith? asked Rani as they both rushed into the attic. My sensors have detected some kind of alien upload onto the internet. Aliens on Facebook? questioned Clyde. Not quite, Clyde, came the curt response. Rani jumped in. But there is something, right? There is evidence of some kind of alien life converted into digital biodata and streamed directly into the internet. I have isolated the specific part of the internet, but tracking the alien life down will not be easy. Clyde frowned. Hang on, but what about Sarah Jane and Luke? Looks like we'll have to do this one ourselves, Clyde, replied Rani. She knew it would be tricky, but it had to be done. Either someone was in danger or someone was dangerous. Whichever it was, Rani knew they had to be found in the internet. Clyde was interested for simpler reasons. So, we're going online to find aliens. Why cool? At Rockshaw Reservoir, it doesn't take long for Sarah Jane's investigative instincts to lead her to a nearby cave. Mom, be careful cautions Luke as they both enter the cave. Something up ahead moves. It's okay, Luke. I think we've found a survivor, she replies and continues forwards, only to walk right into the very frightened pilot, brandishing a gun at both her and Luke. He shouts nervously. Stay where you are! Take one more step and I'll shoot! <laughs>